Well, good morning, White Park. How are you guys this morning? Good. I, I like a crowd that talks back. So uh, this morning, I'm going to try and get you energized. I come from the great state of Colorado. I was going to tell you that I bring greetings from the Broncos, but then I sat through the pre-service meeting and realized that might cause me some anxiety this morning. <laughs> Go Chiefs, there you go, that's right. So, no, I, I do come to you this morning with greetings. Thank you guys for just your hospitality this weekend. Uh, you guys have just been tremendous to me and my family. Uh, men, it was a pleasure to spend the weekend with you. I know you're bored of me. You heard me Friday night, Saturday morning, and now you gotta hear me for another hour and a half, something like that. You know, Jeff told me not to worry about the timer on the screen, so I, I take that to heart. But uh, but in all seriousness, we are just so grateful to be here. One of the joys of being a pastor that occasionally uh, gets the opportunity to go and preach at different places is that you get to see the church as a whole. You get outside of your little box of my, uh, my box in Parker, Colorado of Cross Family Church, and I get to go and I get to see my brothers and sisters in Christ in different places, and that is always an encouragement to me. It reminds me of what the Apostle Paul wrote many times as he was encouraged by the brothers, whether it be in Galatia or Ephesians or wherever, wherever it may be. And so I'm just reminded of that this week. And I wanted to say a quick moment, uh, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Matt said in your announcement video. You guys are blessed with a tremendous man in Jeff. You guys have been blessed uh, with his family. They are dear friends of ours, and Jeff and I both served in Indiana before uh, we went to Colorado, and then he eventually came here. We did our doctorate work together, and so I have been able to see behind the glass, so to speak, with Jeff. And I just want to tell you this morning that he is who you think he is. He is a man of God who loves the Lord and desires nothing more than to make Jesus known. And so, Jeff, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, this morning. This morning, we're going to be talking out of Genesis 45. We're going to be talking, what I've just kind of titled this message is just the power of reconciliation. The power of reconciliation. If, uh, if, you, uh, if you're a, a, a wife and your husband was here this weekend, I've already heard from a couple of you ladies about the fact that we've been talking about Joseph. We're going to continue that story this morning as we go into his word. We're going to be in Genesis 45, 1 through 15, but I want to give you just a little picture of where we are before we get there. You see, Joseph, if you go back into chapter 37, our narrative starts when he is a 17-year-old young man. He's a 17-year-old who is the favorite of his father. He is the 11th of 12 brothers, and his father has adored him. The text opens in that chapter by telling the story of how Joseph reported of his brothers. Most likely when we study the text, we believe that Joseph brought a false report or at least embellished a report of his brothers, and that just incensed uh, the brothers against him. His father also incensed them against him when he gives him the robe of many colors. And so later in that chapter, as Joseph is sent out to go and find his brothers, uh, they plot this plan to kill him. Reuben steps in first and says, no, 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 let's throw him in the pit. Judah steps in later and says, no, 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 let's not. What good is it for us to leave him here? Let's sell him and make some money and send him on his way to Egypt. And so Joseph is sold and ends up in the house of Potiphar, one of the Egyptian officials for Pharaoh, and he finds great favor four times in that chapter, chapter 39. The text tells us that the Lord was with Joseph. As you look at the narrative of Joseph, you see the hand of God, the, the providence of God all on that story as he leads and he guides and he protects and he provides for Joseph. And he goes from Potiphar's house and the text tells us that God gave him great favor. And when he gave Joseph favor, that also means that he gave Potiphar great favor. And so Potiphar began to grow in his wealth and his influence. And then, unfortunately, uh, Joseph drew the attention of Potiphar's wife, who tried to seduce him time and time again. And after rebelling time and rejecting time and time again, one day she catches him alone and he flees that sexual immorality. He flees sin. He, he runs, but in the process, she grabs his garment and strips him of his garment and then holds that and tells her husband and the rest of the household that he has tried to harm her. 
And Potiphar has no choice but where you see God's hand come in because where Potiphar would normally have taken the life of his slave, he instead sends him to prison, to the king's prison, where Joseph then sits there. And it says at the end of that chapter that once again, God was with Joseph, guiding his step, protecting him, and gave him great favor with the prison keeper. And so now Joseph has not only been put in charge of all of the Potiphar's house, but now he's been in charge of all the prisoners. And so there he finds great success. And time goes by, and he's ministering to the king's cupbearer and the king's baker. And they uh, have these woes, and uh, they come to him with these dreams they've had. You see, dreams are an important part of the Joseph narrative, are they not? What I didn't tell you back in chapter 37 is one of the things that really made his brothers mad was the fact that God gave him a call. God gave him a call in the fact that he gave him two dreams. In both dreams, his brothers would bow down to him, and that infuriated his brothers. And now the cupbearer and the baker come to them with their dreams. In a similar fashion, God gives him the interpretation of these dreams. God is with him once again. And so he interprets that the baker is going to die and the cupbearer is going to be restored. And he just simply says this to him. He says, hey guys, would you please remember me when you get back into Pharaoh's presence? The text tells us at the end of that chapter that the cupbearer, goes back, but what does he do? He forgets Joseph. Joseph continues in this tumultuous life. And so it's two years later until Pharaoh has two dreams that he cannot understand. And Pharaoh brings in all the men to try and interpret these dreams. And, and he goes, all his sorcerers, all his men of wisdom, and they have no answer. They do not understand what it means. And so the cupbearer finally has that aha moment, right? We've all had those in our lives that, oh yeah, wait a minute, there's this guy in prison who interpreted my dream and brought me back to success here in your house. And Pharaoh goes and has him brought from the prison cell into his presence and Joseph cleaned up and Joseph interpreted his dream and he said simply this, look Pharaoh, God has told me, he gave credit to God, God has told me that you are going to have seven years of plenty and then you're going to have seven years of famine. And here's how I would do that. And he lays out a plan. And by the hand of God, Pharaoh looks at him and says, who else can we find that has the spirit of God like you? And he places him in a second position in his kingdom. He gives him authority over all the land. And, and Joseph takes care of that. He, it says in the text that he stores so much grain that they cannot even measure it. It is immeasurable what he has given them. And so he saves the people of Egypt, but some distance off in the land of Canaan, his family still languishes. It's been 30, uh, excuse me, 17 years, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. He was 17, he came to power at 30. It was 13 years of languishing in that difficult time of discouragement and difficulty. We've had seven good years and now we're two years into the family, we get to our story. So we are some 19, excuse, Gosh, I cannot do math. I'm from Alabama. We are 22 years later this morning. Man, 22 years later when we have our passage come. The brothers have come once. He sent them back because he desperately wants to see his younger brother. He asked about his father. He says, look, I'm going to keep Simeon, your brother, until you return. So they go back. They convince their father to send his new favorite child, Benjamin, down. And Benjamin has come. They have a great evening of fellowship. And Joseph is testing them because his ha he has his servant place the cup in their bags along with all their money. And so the next morning as they depart, he then sends his man after him. And the men are overcome. The brothers do not know what to do. And Judah steps up and makes an impassioned plea for his brother. He says, look, don't take Benjamin's life. Would you please take mine? It will kill my father if he does not return. And that leads us to where we are here in chapter 45. If you got your Bibles or follow along on the screen uh, behind me, we would love to see what the narrator would say to us beginning in verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed in his presence. 
So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near and he said, look, I am your brother Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine had been in the land these two years and there are yet five years in which there will neither be plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father of Pharaoh and Lord of all this house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children and your flocks, your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you for there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. And then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and I just pray that you would just come into this place this morning with these brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe there'd be somebody here this morning who doesn't have a personal relationship with you, Father, and I pray that you would reveal to us and would show us the power of reconciliation. Father, as we look at this Joseph narrative, we have studied that this weekend with the men of this church. Father, I just pray that you would again speak through me this morning. I pray that I would get out of the way, Lord. I pray that I would hide behind the cross and that my words and my thoughts would be yours. And Father, I pray that when we all leave here today, that we would leave here changed, not because of what I have said, but rather because we have all encountered you, the holy, living, righteous God. Lord, we are grateful, we are thankful, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we look at this text, I want us to see the provision of God at play here. I want us to understand how God has provided for Joseph, and in doing so, he has provided for uh, the Hebrews. He has also then provided for all the world, because the text tells us back in uh, chapter 41 that Joseph not only had enough food for all the Egyptians, he not only had a food for all of his family and for all the Israelites, but he also had enough food for the entire world. And as we see that provision that God provides, I want us to understand kind of this main idea this morning, and it's just simply this, is that God desires and pursues reconciliation with his people. If you look at the story of Joseph, you begin to ask the question, why would God do this? Why would God save them? Why would God give them the provision that they need to survive another day? I believe it is entirely because God desires reconciliation with his people. God desires that no one be separated from him. And through using Joseph to do that, he is providing a way for the people to receive the physical needs that they so desperately have, and also to then look to the spiritual needs. As you begin really kind of walking through the text here, you'll see that Joseph could no longer control himself in verse one there. If you go back and read the first encounter that they have had with, the brothers have had with Joseph, two times he was uncontrollable and weeping as he saw his brothers come and begin to beg for food. His brother Reuben describes in 42 chapter 21 this uh, this time in which he can tell Joseph not knowing who he is as he's speaking in his own language, not understanding that he could be understood by Joseph. He talks about the fact that they had left their brother in the pit and it says this, it says in chapter 37 that when they threw him in the pit that they sat down to eat. But in chapter 42, Reuben reveals, I think, the horror that his brothers had lived with for years because he says, we sat there while our brother cried out to us and pled for his life. You see, there was great separation between Joseph and the other 10. They despised him. They wanted nothing to do with him. 
This is a prime, perfect example of what a broken relationship looks like. And yet some 22 years later, now as they stand before Joseph the second time, he cannot control himself and he clears the room and he gets all of the Egyptians out and he wept aloud. And look what it says to here. It says that the Egyptians heard it and Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? I love that. What you don't see there in Joseph's exclamation is any reference to the difficulty or the trials and tribulations that he has endured. What is the first thing he says? Is my father still alive? Joseph deeply loves his father. And when he identifies himself, he doesn't begin to blame them for what has happened. He doesn't begin to talk about all the trials and tribulations that he has endured because of their actions. But rather, he just simply sits there and says, look, how is my dad? I am Joseph. Is he still alive? And the reaction of the brothers is one of terror. What does, the, what does the text say? It says there in, in verse 3, but his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. Here, 22 years later, they're looking at this strong young man, this 30, uh, well, he's now 39-year-old ruler of Egypt. He is the one that has given them bread and everything they needed the first time. They've come back the second time. He's not in his traditional garb. He is wearing the, the clothes and the attire of Pharaoh. He is a clean-shaven man. And so as they, he says, I am Joseph, how is my father? Their minds are beginning to spin and they're beginning to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Is this really who we think it is? And they are absolutely terrorized because in their minds, what we put him in the pit we sold him into slavery he is now in complete power and control over us what is he going to do you see don't underestimate or miss the fact that joseph had a prime opportunity to enact revenge on his family it's amazing. If you go back into chapter 44, you'll see where the dream was completely, the first dream was, was fulfilled because all the brothers had come before him and had what? Bowed down. The call on his life was being fulfilled in that moment. And the brothers were absolutely terrorized. And so Joseph, understand the situation, and in verse 4 says to his brothers, look, look, come near to me, please. There's the, the plural is used there in the sense that he's asking all of the brothers to come to him, not just Benjamin, not just the, the brother that was from his, his biological mother, right? He was asking all of them, please come to me. And they came near, and he says to them, look, I am your brother Joseph whom you sold into Egypt, he now is, is realizing they don't understand everything going on. I've got to clarify this for them. Yet, yes, I am the guy you sold. And when he does that, he begins to see the fear in their eyes because now they realize, oh my goodness, this really is our brother who we sold to the traitors out of the pit and has now come down to Egypt. And so he says, look, 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 hold on, hold on. Verse five, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves. Calm down. I know this is shocking. I know this is not what you expected, but, but calm down. He says, look, for God sent me before you to what? Preserve life. I love what Joseph is doing here. He's giving them a theological lesson with application, right? Joseph is preaching the perfect message to his brothers there this morning. I just hope that I can come in somewhat, uh, somewhat similar to what he is doing because he applies that theology to me. He says, look, God sent me before you. You sold me into slavery, but the provident hand of God that is working all things for good, he is taking what you did and he has placed this for his purposes. And Joseph is no longer seeking retribution. See, Joseph has forgiven his brothers. His heart was broken. If you go back into 44 and you look in that chapter and you read that chapter, his brothers, as they stand before Joseph, not knowing who he is, speaking in their own language, confess their sin against God. They confess what they have done to Joseph. They recognize and acknowledge the sin in their life. 
And as Judah makes the impassioned speech and he offers himself as a uh, alternate sacrifice uh, for Benjamin, please keep me, send my brother home. He does that knowing that if he does not take his younger brother home, his father will literally die. And Judah loves his father. And Judah has developed this, um, really has been repentant in his life as you study the overall narrative. And he now is exclaiming that to him. And he's going, look, keep me, send him home. And Joseph can just no longer handle this. And he has forgiven his brother. He says in verse six, the famine has been in the land these two years. There are five more yet to go. Verse seven, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. Notice the juxtapositions that Joseph uses here and the narrator describes. Use You did this. You sold me, but God sent me. It was not you who sent me here, but God. You see, Joseph is recognizing the power of God and what is going on in his midst. He's recognizing the fact that God is using that to preserve his people. And not only preserve his people, to preserve the entire world. And I believe that's because God desires and pursues reconciliation with his people. He desires that no man should perish. And so he's using Joseph to accomplish that purpose. And so Joseph continues and says, look, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all this house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go to my father and say to him, imagine when you're Jacob and you hear this, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and notice what he says, do not tarry. Joseph so desperately desires to see his dad. As that 17-year-old boy, the called, the chosen, the favorite. He has missed his dad desperately for the last 22 years. You think about it. He spent more of his life at this point away from his father than he has in his presence. Joseph wants reconciliation. He desperately wants to see his dad and to be a part of that. He says, do not tarry. And then he gives him the beautiful promise here in verse 10. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. It's important to understand about Goshen. Goshen was in that eastern Nile area. It was also one of the most fertile uh, places of land in Egypt. And so when he says, I am going to place you in, in Goshen, what he really means here is, I am going to bless you and your family and your generations to come because you have the best land in the land of Egypt to raise your livestock and to grow. And what do we know when we go back into Exodus 1? Why did the Egyptians want the Israelites gone? Because they had been blessed so fervently by God that their livestock and their people were beginning to outnumber that of the Egyptians. And it says the favor of God was on Joseph because it says this in Exodus 1. It says that there arose a Pharaoh who no longer knew Joseph. You see, Joseph's reputation, because he was a man of God and because God had blessed him and called him, lasted for years and years and years until finally they forgot who he was. So he gives the people the land. You shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, your flocks, your herds, all that you have. I love verse 11. There I will what? Harm you? No, he says, there I will provide for you. The man who was harmed by his brothers now loves them so much that he will provide for them. For there are yet five years of famine to come. You drop down to 13. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt, of all that you have seen. Again, he emphasizes hurry and bring my father down here. And 14, you see a moment of embrace. I joke with our men this weekend, you know, I, I used the F word at one time. And I know what you're thinking right now. Oh my goodness, a pastor using the F word. Well, in a men's retreat, that's the word feelings, right? We don't like the word feelings. 
And so at one point we were talking about that, but you look at verse 14 here, there is a great emotional reunion with his brothers. It says here that, that Joseph fell upon his brothers, Benjamin's neck, and he wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And then he kissed all of his brothers and he wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. You see, the power of reconciliation is absolutely impressive. It is what God uses to restore relationships. And 22 years of brokenness have been erased and vanish in an instant. The brothers who once sold Joseph now embrace him. The brother who was sold into slavery does not enact revenge, but rather provides for his brothers. And we see the power of reconciliation, and we see that God desires that for us, not only with himself, but also with other people in our lives. And there's three things this morning that I want you to see kind of out of this passage concerning reconciliation. The first is just simply this, that reconciliation requires admission of guilt and forgiveness of the sin. You cannot be reconciled to someone if you do not acknowledge the sin upon which you have committed. You cannot be reconciled with someone if they are unwilling to forgive you of whatever sin you have committed. Reconciliation requires that omission of guilt. It requires that forgiveness of the sin. We see this in our lives with the Heavenly Father, do we not? How do you become a child of the King? You bow your knee, you humble your heart, you acknowledge that he is Lord and you are not. You acknowledge that you have sinned against him. You're reminded of Romans 3.23 that says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You say that, you mean that, and you know what? God has already forgiven you of your sin. And you are reconciled to him. You are made in perfect reunion and relationship with him again. You have a picture of the Garden of Eden beginning to be restored. And one day when we are in his presence, I can't wait to see what that is going to be like for all of us who have been reconciled to God because we have acknowledged our sin and he has forgiven us. But that example does not simply stop with our relationship with our Heavenly Father. That relationship is what we as the church should employ within the church and outside the church. That is what we should be doing with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should be acknowledging our sin with each other. We should be forgiving each other. What do Joseph and the brothers do? Go back into chapter 44 for just a minute. And I apologize to your tech team because I didn't give them this passage. But in 44, 14, when Jude and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground. Skip to verse 16. And Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servant. The brothers acknowledge the sin. They acknowledge their guilt. I, I believe wholeheartedly, quite honestly, that they were terrified of what they had done. I believe that that day when they sat there and ate the meal that Joseph had brought them from his father, as they sat down and ate that meal, hearing the cries of their brother in the pit haunted them. They acknowledge that. And Joseph in our passage this morning breaks down weeping because he has forgiven them. And you see that beautiful picture of the power of reconciliation. When the brothers have acknowledged their sin, Joseph has forgiven. And then verses 14 and 15 show us the reconciliation that takes place. It's a beautiful picture, but I want you to see the second thing out of that is that reconciliation produces transformation. Skip down again, if you've got your Bibles open, I apologize, I didn't tell the tech team. But 28, verse 28 in chapter 45, when you see this, Israel said, Israel is Jacob. His name had been changed, but it's not until Joseph has been reconciled with the brothers that the narrator begins to call him Israel. And it says there in verse, uh, verse 28, and Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is alive. I will go and see him before I die. 
The reconciliation of the brothers produced a transformation in the father. The father a few verses ago and said, I am going to die. I am going down to Sheol. He said that when he lost his son, Joseph, when they convince him to give their son, Benjamin, he says the same thing. I will not make this. I will die. Why has this awful thing come upon me? And you get to the end of 45 and the reconciliation has happened. The brothers have returned and told him the good news. And what do we see happen? We see it is enough. My son is alive. I will go and see him. There is a transformation in his life. Believer, let me tell you something. When you go find that broken relationship in your life and you admit you're wrong or you can forgive the one who wronged you and you reconcile, there will be transformation. Your relationship will be completely different. The brothers who despised their brother, Joseph, 22 years earlier, sold him into slavery, now sit and weep and hug and converse with each other. Ladies and gentlemen, when you come to faith in Christ, the reconciliation that you have with God produces transformation. The old ways are gone. The new has come. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, that reconciliation produces a new life. A life that no longer focuses on self, but rather focuses on what God desires. A life that focuses on what is best for my brother and sister in Christ. A life that produces the fruit of Galatians 5 of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. And the desires and the, uh, the, spirit of the fruit of the flesh is, is no longer there. It is gone because you are a new creation. That is the power of transformation. The absolute power of transformation and reconciliation. But lastly this morning too, I want us to see that reconciliation also acknowledges the higher purposes of God. You know what I love about the Joseph narrative, we talked about this this weekend with the men, is just simply uh, this idea that all throughout the process, uh, when Joseph goes into Potiphar's house, and it says four times in chapter 39 that the Lord was with him, Joseph began to recognize that this was not all of his power, his success was not all of his abilities, but rather he recognized that God had placed his hand of favor upon him. He acknowledged those higher purposes of God. He acknowledged that his time in Potiphar's house, his time in the prison, his time in Pharaoh's house, now as number two in the land, had a higher purpose. And that purpose was that he was a precursor to Christ. Just as Joseph saved all the earth from famine, Jesus is there today offering us the earth salvation from our sins. Just as Joseph uh, lived a, a life worthy of honor and faithfulness, Jesus came and lived that life. He lived the sinless life. Joseph was not sinless. I know I, I probably shocked some people with that this weekend, but Joseph was not sinless. Joseph was not perfect, but he is a type pointing to the one who is. And in that, Reconciliation acknowledges the higher purposes of God. And I hope you understand this morning that recognizing that and seeing that points us to the fact that God desires and pursues reconciliation with his people. May I submit to you this morning that that is the theme of all of scripture. God's pursuit of us. Go back into Genesis 1 and 2 and look at the creation account. It is a perfect place. It is awesome. It is wonderful. There is perfect relationship there with God and his people. And then man messes it up. The fateful chapter of Genesis 3 where man sins and creates that separation between us and God. But what I love, and even in the end of chapter 3, God is already promising the way of salvation. 
And then God pursues the Israelites who do what? Continually reject him. They continually reject him. He goes on and he has a way of salvation with his son and he brings his son to earth to live that perfect life and offer that sacrifice to us and we continue to reject him. This morning, I hope you see that God desires nothing more than to be reconciled with you. And he desires that so much that he's willing to pursue you, to follow you, wherever you go, always offering his handout saying, I am here, follow me. But we must not miss not only our call on God's life, uh, God has given us that call of salvation. God has given us that call of a purpose as we talked about this weekend. But in doing so, part of our purpose is that we need to be reconciled with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be a body of Christ that lives in unity and peace and one that unites together with a common purpose. We, we all have a specific call and a specific purpose, but we're all part of the bigger purpose, which is Matthew 28. We are called to make disciples, and we make disciples by doing two things, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And to baptize somebody, you gotta tell them the truth about Jesus first. You gotta share your faith. You gotta walk alongside those who are lost and are broken who look at you in your life and don't know how you do it. And we make disciples by baptizing them, but also, and we often forget this, we also, a second part of making disciples is teaching them all that I have commanded you. You see, our job is not to just go and evangelize, but our job is then to take that convert, take that one who has been transformed, who reconciliation has produced the new being. We take them and we walk with them in unity, helping them, teaching them, loving them, helping them to grow in their faith. As we wind down this morning, I just want to simply ask you a couple of questions. Number one, are you reconciled to God? I'm not here this morning to beat you over the head. I'm not here to scream at you and to try and make you do something against your will. That's not what pastors are called to do. But we are called to present the truth, to give you the opportunity. And if you're here this morning in this room or watching online, if you have never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, my only question to you is, what is stopping you from being reconciled to your Heavenly Father? Pastor Jeff and this wonderful church would love to walk with you and talk about that. Secondly, is there a relationship in your life that you know is broken? Is there a father or a mother, a brother or a sister a niece, a nephew, an aunt, an uncle, a coworker, a neighbor, a college friend, a high school friend? Is there, is there a relationship in your life where there is brokenness? Sometimes the best way to share the gospel is to exemplify the gospel. Sometimes the best way to bring someone to Christ is to simply take that first step, just as Judah took that first step and acknowledged their sin and pleaded with his brother and Joseph followed up the next step and forgave them. Is there a relationship in your life that is just causing you sleepless nights or pain? Has it been 22 years like Joseph and his brothers? But is there a relationship that you need to restore? When you do that, the hope is that the gospel shines in those situations. The hope is that that reconciliation will produce transformation in your life and the relationship with your friend, your family member, your colleague, your neighbor. You need to seek that. But lastly this morning, are you called to be a part of God's reconciling work in our world? Is God calling you, giving you a purpose of serving in some capacity here at Wyatt Park? Has he gifted you in certain ways in which you've not been using those to fulfill his mission? Because you see, I believe that the mission of Christ 
when he came to this earth was just simply to offer reconciliation of mankind to God the Father. The purpose of our lives is simply to bring him honor, to bring him glory, but to help him accomplish the purpose. So is God calling you to serve in that ministry of reconciliation? Do you have gifts and talents that you're not using here at Wyatt Park? Has God placed a call on your life to ministry or missions that you keep ignoring? Let me tell you, if God has placed that call in your life, you will be miserable until you acknowledge it. And I hope that you find the hope of the life of Joseph and even the hope in the life of the brothers when they acknowledge that call, when they reconcile with each other, there was great transformation that led to God blessing abundantly the generations to come. That is the power of reconciliation. In just a moment, the praise team is going to come up and we're going to sing a song and we're going to have a time, what we call is our invitation. And at that time, you're going to have a couple of options. If God has said something to you or has laid something on your heart or if there is a relationship that you need to reconcile, maybe, maybe, just maybe, you've never decided to call Jesus Lord of your life. And you want to do that this morning. Pastor Jeff's going to be in the Welcome Center. The, the, the altar will be open for you to come and pray if you so feel led. So maybe you need to acknowledge that. Maybe you just want prayer over a broken relationship. Maybe you just simply want to, to have someone pray for you that you would have the courage to go and to take that step of reconciliation, to seek restoration in that, in that moment and in that relationship so that God can produce some transformation that we can give him the glory and the honor for. Or maybe you want to come and pray about serving in some capacity. Whatever it is that God has laid on your heart, Pastor Jeff will be in the Welcome Center. The altar will be open. Now, I just ask that you would respond to God wherever you are. Our Heavenly Father, we just love you this morning and give you the praise for all that you have said and all that you have done. Lord, we are unworthy. Father, just as Joseph was unworthy of your call, Father, we are unworthy of the call that you have given us. But Lord, we are so thankful for your love and your grace and your mercy. Lord, as we have seen just the, the power of reconciliation this morning through your text, Father, how you can do amazing and wonderful things, not because of our goodness, but rather because of all that you have inside of you that is good. And I pray for the believers here this morning that we would be encouraged to continue to walk in faith and unity as a body of Christ, pursuing what you have called us to do. Father, I pray for the one who may be here this morning who does not know you, Father, that they would commit their life today. They would just simply acknowledge the sin in their life that we have all sinned, that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And that sin has separated us from you. And Father, we have a way out. We have hope. We have a way for that relationship to be restored by simply acknowledging you as Lord, confessing our sin, and committing to follow you all of our days. And Lord, if anybody be here that is struggling with a call on their life to serve here, to serve in full-time ministry, to serve in missions, Lord, encourage them, strengthen them, empower them, Father, to make that public and make that known. Above all today, God, we love you. We are so thankful for all that you have blessed us with. And Lord, we just want to give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name.